What's up, everyone? New Champs Energy are the kings of the LCS as they took down Cloud9 and Team Liquid in uh, epic fashion in New Jersey. Myself, Dom, and LS here to break things down for y'all. Uh, LS, what's up, man? Why, why we got the LSXYZ photo going on, man? All right, so man, a bit of a conundrum of things. It always is. So last week on Thursday... Uh, Thursday morning, right? Yeah. My phone ended up overheating and it exploded internally. So after that happened, I got locked out of everything. I'm actually still locked out of a lot of things, um, but I managed to get back into some things. I still don't have access to like my cards, uh, my bank, can't get into like uh, um, Discord actually weird sometimes. Like I'm on it right now, it's fine. Um, so that all of that, all that great jazz was happening. And then in addition to that, I don't know what's going on with my PC, but anyone who was on my stream this past weekend knows that every single stream had massive tech issues. So camera just randomly stops working. Mic uh, constantly dies or changes. Microphones, speakers don't work. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing. So here we are. All right. Well, there you go. It is always something. Uh, <laughs> would you like to tell us what phones that maybe we should avoid from overheating? Was it doing something weird? Were like, were you like charging it too long? Were you running so, an app? No, no, no. So I, I so I had a an S twenty one Ultra, okay. and I had it since it came out. And so when it originally overheated, the first thing it said is that the SIM card just like turned itself off. And I'm like, oh, okay, I don't know what's going on. So I Google, so I, I connect to Wi-Fi, and then I Google, like, what's going on, and it says to just restart the phone. And then I yeah. try to restart the phone, and the phone doesn't turn back on, and then I notice that it keeps getting hotter and hotter. So we go to the Samsung store um, in the morning, and we spend countless hours at the Samsung store where they open up the phone and everything, and then just like, oh, well, it overheated so much that a lot of the internal stuff got burned. So uh, then I purchased a new phone, thinking that immediately I could use my SIM card. So we went through the whole process, purchasing a new phone, taking out the SIM card, putting it in, and then do all of that. Now I have an S23 Ultra, and we put the SIM card in, and then the SIM card is not working. So then Samsung can't tell if the SIM card's damaged, so I have to go to SKT. So I'm going to go to SKT, but then SKT can't tell me things by law because I'm a foreigner, and there's, these, there's all these like weird ass fucking regulations. And so then we have to call 114. 114 is like the uh, customer service, like help uh, thingy. And by the time that we figure out that I have to call 114, 114 has closed. So, so it, was, uh, it was an adventure for two days. It was, uh, it was yeah, it was, you know, it's good. Well, nice, man. There you go, Dion. Thank you. I, I, you're, uh, thank you for sharing and explaining to us and also yeah i'm glad this one isn't like health like health related you know maybe maybe a little stress yeah. stress related for sure but you're a healthy boy right you're healthy right now healthy ish yeah this is the first time this has ever uh happened to me i don't know have you guys ever had like something like this where you get like really scared because you're just <laughs> locked out of everything no i mean <laughs> I live in a country what, where, where you know they could give me my own. <laughs> I laughed. I, la I laughed because I thought you were going to be like, "Have you ever? Have you ever experienced a phone exploding? Not not being locked out, but a phone exploding." <laughs> like, no, I have not experienced like an electronic blown up like like that. I guess when I was uh, younger, when I went to the Philippines, I plugged in my like the Game Boys used to need the AA batteries and you could get rechargeable AA batteries with the plug. And I plugged it straight into the vault and that exploded. But that was it, you know. Oh, what the, f okay. Yeah, yeah, because it's different voltage in the in the Philippines. It's, I think it's, it's the same looking plug, but it's 220 in the Philippines. I think here in the States, it's one, 110 or something like that. So it just like exploded. And that was, that was that. Um, okay. Jesus. Yeah, and then like Dom was saying, I I also you know there's just there's ways to get it back in the states. I think the foreigner part for you being in Korea is pretty pretty brutal. Dom, how are you, man? I'm yeah. good. Same old, same old. Really? I mean, come on. There's no way that LS has had all these epic travels. I was over in New Jersey, and I have a bunch of stories I want to share. And then you have nothing from the last like 
a week and a half. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? <laughs> now life is crazy, man. I got attacked by a bear on my way to face check. You know, I fought it off with my bare hands and, you know, now we're here. So <laughs> yeah. there, more exciting that way. Wait, yeah, have you ever seen a bear in person? Um, no. I mean, I've been to... Yeah, not at the zoo. TwitchCon and stuff. Not at the zoo. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. Never mind. All right. <laughs> oh, no. Why? Why? Where are we going with this? Yeah, I was just saying. No, Some of the people might know. resemble bears there. <laughs> like, oh, this is God. what it is. Um, okay. Speaking of bears, I wanted to thank all the fans that came out to the LCS finals here in New Jersey. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, it, it, again guys i really want to reiterate doing? i really want to reiterate <laughs> how awesome it is and the impact that we have with with our show to people it's been it's been a lot of fun and and uh everyone coming up kind of wanting to share uh how they consume face check whether it's at work on the way to work i had uh a, a a couple and the wife saw me in the like like a concourse was like oh my god my husband's a really big fan and i was like are you you not you're not either she's like well yeah me too but like hang on let me go get him he's in his seat you want to say hi and then they came and said hi we we I, there was probably like about a hundred plus people that stopped us or stopped me to say hi and talk about uh face check guys so like again you guys don't get to feel it but uh, the impact that we have is, is pretty awesome so again thanks fans for uh watching supporting and and taking the time to to say hi it, it is it really means a lot to to us so thank you um and like okay yeah that that's enough all right cool let's move on let's let's go to energy the big news right off the top man energy did it it was i think the last team that we had winning I think TL probably was the team that we all had beating them. And then after that, Cloud9, there wasn't really any path for anyone to win. We assume Cloud9 would be the better team on the day. They've got the more uh, the more experience, the bigger talent, the higher ceiling, the coaching staff, the, you know, the momentum. Not the case here. Energy, take the victory. LS, let's start with you, man. What, what did you think about Energy this weekend coming up? Um, I mean, I was really surprised by the end result, but by the time, like, you know, we started getting into like game three and stuff like that, and it started developing, um, I'm pretty sure like everyone that was in my call, I think there was like five of us on that day or six of us or something. I think we all actually just thought like, okay, C9 is actually just going to lose. And it was, it was, it was both interesting that NRG was performing the way that they were. But also interesting in that C9 was like, they did not look like C9 in the finals. At least not like what I think everyone expected out of them. Um, I think they looked like but it, it's amazing for, for NRG. You, you did? Okay. Yeah, when I was watching them, I mean, I feel like they get away so so often with, with games like that game one, where they, you know, just AFK, they don't do anything early game. You know, they just capitalize on mistakes, show up to third Drake, and they just win the third Drake fight because they're, like, better at setups. Um, but, I mean, yeah, like, normally they just get away with it. So I think that C9, they, they looked like themselves. They just finally got punished. I was so happy to see C9 actually get punished for some of these, like, you know, gameplay-related just, like, strategies or whatever you want to call it because my whole gripe with them for since, since MSI was that they didn't elevate their game or alter the way they played at all during you know during the whole split they didn't try to you know incorporate more like planned setups early dives four man plays draft like a pushing lane you know crash like wave three or four with jungler there dive them bring like hover like your mid with prio they don't do any of that they kind of just like exist and you know they'll they'll take a herald fight if it's good for them if not it's fine they'll just chill and then third drake happens and berserker will just carry like the whole team so for me, it, it felt like I was watching C9. I just, I was so disappointed after the first game because the first game, it felt like they were just doing the same bullshit that they always do, where they just like AFK and they end up winning the game. And I'm like, damn, is that really just good enough to win a championship? But then when we got into like games, okay, you know, games two, three, four, it felt like they started actually getting punished, you know, for their bad laning, their lack of early game plans, um, 
they weren't just scaling and, and you know, able to just win the game for free on, on a Drake or something. So I guess that, that was my angle on it. So for me, like, wh one of the reasons that, like, I'm saying, like, it doesn't look like C9 is historic, like, the last couple of weeks that C9 had played leading up to this match, right? Mm -hmm. They almost rotate exclusively the same champions or, like, the same theme over and over and over. And in this series, one, they're playing champions that they haven't played in forever which I, I just thought was really strange. But then in addition to that, they're, they're like Eminus is, is just, he's all over the place inside of the games. And then Fudge is randomly playing Rumble and he has not played Rumble at all. And it's not that I don't doubt that he, you know, practiced it or something, right? It just felt very off in, in the way that they were approaching the whole series. Yeah. Uh, what did you make in game two after they get the first victory? Falling back to Annie for MS there and, and kind of taking, oh. it, taking out. So anything. this is so this is the game that just it, it's like the the culmination of, of everything that I hate about C9 is that they can't play these engage comps like this. When you look at, you know, some of the best teams in the world, if you look at like JDG, for example, they're so practiced on these like Annie Wukong Rakan team comps where you draft multiple forms of engage from different areas and then you learn how to create pockets of vision you have like people buy more sweepers than average you'll have 369 sitting in like the the line bush on the side of mid he'll be with the sweeper you'll have like kanavi over a wall you know the ante might might be in a different location as well and they'll understand like when the enemy team walks past a certain point that now like you have the ability to follow everyone up on the engage and it's not like the type of thing where you need all your engage to land on the, on the same targets. You don't need like a Gragas ult, an Annie ult, a Rakan ult, uh, Rakan RW, and a, you know, Wukong ult on top of two people to kill them. You know, it's all about just understanding how much CC you need or like when you need to actually go in in order to win the fight. I mean, you could win a fight by just engaging, chunking people to like 30%. They can't fight anymore. And then you just like kill people afterwards. And C9 has always struggled with this like type of, you know, multiple layers of engage from different places. They don't normally play like that. A lot of their their best comps, um, historically, if you look over the last, like, you know, three splits that this team has been together, it's been like Lulu Zeri or like Lulu with Aphilios. And it's always just like, oh, give Berserker a lot of like tools, give him more HP, attack speed, whatever. And he's just going to carry the fight himself. And I think that that just doesn't like... I don't feel like that's good enough to just be able to like win all the time. And when they go international, they just get smacked. So the fact that they still can't play these types of team comps, I mean, I think this shows how limited they are as a team strategically. Uh, another thing that kind of came up. Well, what do you, what, what do you think about that uh, LS in terms of their inability to play these engage comps and, and have been falling back to down on the bottom side of the map, the, the, the scalers that they, they didn't really like Scalar with Enchanter, and they really didn't play that this the, the whole series. Um, I mean, I I agree with it, but I the the thing for me is I I like I don't think there's many teams that can actually play like uber cohesively in North America, pretty much anything. But I do agree that when C9 has like an affinity for this type of team composition, I think at the very beginning of the split they were getting away with murder with a lot of engaged team compositions, but I would agree with the sentiment that they're not ever going to play it at a level that we're going to see at Worlds. And I think that when Eminence is a part of the equation, and he's been looking absolutely right, yeah, I mean, it's, it's terrible the last two months um, that he's been playing, I think that they're going to have a lot of issues in that regard, because Eminence was supposed to be the mechanical player that would maybe help bridge some problems with like trying to go with this approach and whatnot. And I think that he's actually just been faltering quite a lot in summer split overall, but especially in the series where it does, doesn't look like anything special. And throughout the series, I was actually almost thinking like, wow, unironically, if they just had a worse mechanical mid laner, but who was a lot more just patient and controlled as a player, they would probably actually be better off, right? Sort of like an ode to like yesteryear C9 mid laners or like even Jensen when they won with Jensen or something Jensen. like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like, it, but th that's a weird thing. And Berserker was almost like getting away with bullshit in the series a couple of times. And that was kind of scary. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, another champ that 
I think was highly, highly built up, rightfully so, not not uh, unfairly so. The Maokai. Maokai comes on in here in game number three with the Maokai Ari, Zeri, and uh, Aatrox comp um, against Energies, Jax, uh, Sejuani, uh, the surprise Talia, and the Kaisa being handed on over to FBI where he dropped 16 on him. Uh, what did you make of 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 that kind of composition and that kind of that that game three where you had FBI kind of carry the game and it still wasn't out of reach until late? I mean, for for me, looking at this game, number one, I really hate the pairing of Maokai Ari. I think it makes like almost no sense. If you look at when Ari's always been successful, it's been with like Wukong, Vi, these types of champions that can assist Ari in like getting to the point where. You know, you can get kills mid when you go Maokai Ari. Enemy mid laner can go Merc Treads, especially a champion like Talia that can build like, you know, relatively tanky, I guess. Um, it's always just going to be an issue for like the, the Ari later on in the game. I mean, the Ari was almost completely, uh, completely uh, useless. I think they caught, got caught off guard by the Jax pick, um, which was really surprising. I mean, this is the reason why I think energy won is that they they came back into this series with different picks that they hadn't been playing before. Like we hadn't been seeing NRG play, you know, Jax in, in previous uh, series. We hadn't seen them play Rumble. Like, they, they weren't that team. They came in with this different look, and it felt like C9 had no idea what to do. It's like, Jax is picked, and what is Fudge go to? He goes to, like, the Aatrox into Jax matchup, which isn't even, like, a, an inherently winning matchup. I mean, he just had no answer to, to this pick. So, um, w like, in these games, I mean, it just feels like Berserker has to completely 1v9 the game. It's just, they like, his teammates are not playing well. No one actually is is performing like better than their you know opposing player. I would say I would say the the other four players got outperformed, and just at some point Berserker just can't carry the fights anymore. Like he just doesn't have the damage, and you know it's, it, when you're losing in other positions and you have an Enchanter plus a Zeri to fall back on, it's a different story than when you have Alistar Zeri and the Zeri is just like on her own. So these types of teams, like I don't know. I mean, this is the thing that's so weird about C9 is. I don't understand the pattern of the draft, right? Because based on what we saw, game one, C9 picks Kaisa. Kaisa looks mega OP, right? Like Berserker just completely smurfs on it. Game two, energy goes blue. Energy first picks the Kaisa. And once again, the Kaisa is strong. So in game three, it seemed so weird that they went to the Maokai because Contracts isn't a super good Maokai himself. I think if you first pick the Kaisa, they pick away Maokai and you just go Sejuani um, on C9 side then you're at a completely comfortable spot in the draft based on like what we've seen in the series, not even just based off champ champion strength, just like what we've seen the champions actually look like in the series. So it seemed so weird to give away agency from a berserker pick to have like a slightly better tank jungler. I think they got really mind gamed into the fact that they were unbeaten on Maokai. They're like, oh man, our Maokai is just unbeatable. If it's ever up, we just take it and we get a free win. And then when you look at like how the whole draft came together, it's like, well, now you have like Maokai Aatrox Ari like that's your team comp like it just it never it didn't feel as good as it could have been if they just drafted in a in, in a different way and they just stick to what had been working in the series I mean it looked like Kaisa was like pretty much unbeatable in the series right so it, I, yeah. I don't understand the fact that they didn't pick it when they had the opportunity to and then in game number four they banned Kaisa on blue side so I, I, like their perception of what was going on in the series, I, I felt like it was a lot different than the perception of people watching the series. Um, that's a great point. And that was actually brought up. It, it was probably the best question that we had from the press uh, for Cloud9 that it, after that, then Cloud9 ends up banning Kaisa on blue side for game number four. It, it let them go to Draven, but uh, that was asked and Mithy spoke up and said, <laughs> You know, I think hindsight's twenty twenty, and now I look back on it, and I think that's something that we could have um, first picked ourselves. Yeah. But um, yeah, and then gave so credit to energy. On on my stream, I was watching. I was obviously watching the series, and one thing I said before this draft was, I was like, "I'm smelling a Berserker Draven game." Like I was, I was, I was calling the Berserker Draven because, and the reasoning for it, which is, I assume, their reasoning as well, was it felt like Berserker is performing so well in the series. He's like by far our best player. And, Berser and Berserker's Draven is also something that normally gets banned from him, um, like four or five in games where it looks like it could be possible. I was like, just give him the fucking agency, you know, give him the rock, so to speak. 
and let him carry you. But then when we got to the four or five, I was like, okay, I know I said that like, like it was feeling like a Draven game, just, you know, coming into it, you want to look for a potential Draven angle. You know, you have players that have an affinity for Draven. And if there's an opportunity, you try to get them in the spot where they can actually deliver on the picks that they're really good at. You know, like Jackie Love is another um, example. I mean, you just have these types of players. I mean, Guma plays, plays Draven as well. You have these players um, where you want to just always be conscious of if they give you a good game for it, play it. But then when you saw the game like like playing out and you're like, okay, enemy team is Alistar. They're probably just going to like AFK farm bot lane. Sven is not the type of player who wants to play it like a ton of engagers. Like he'll play them if they're good. If not, he won't play them. I was thinking there they should have pivoted and went for some type of like Braum lane and just accepted like the Braum into Alistar trade with an AD carry, like another AD carry that Berserker plays because he can just play anything, something that scales slightly better. And then maybe you have like a, a, a higher chance to win because enemy team has essentially drafted like a lot of engage. They've drafted like Rel jungle, they have Alistar and you know, you expect an engaged champion is coming on five, which ended up happening with the Nico. If you draft something like a Braum there and you just stabilize and you play for like a longer range AD carry, you potentially win this game. But the Draven pick was something that I like. I could feel the Draven pick in the series because of how 1v9 it felt like Berserker was. Like that game three was, you know, everyone underperforming and Berserker just trying to carry regardless. He's like 1v5ing team fights, literally. Uh, what do we? What? what well, do I mean, I, 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 yeah. Go no, ahead. I mean, I completely agree that it, it. Well, there's, there's also like weird things for this series, but not even just the series, but like C9 in general for me, right? Um, so obviously NRG, they, they played Ivern. Uh, you know, they, they played Ivern in game two, mm -hmm. and then after they play Ivern in game two, C9 actually bans it out twice. But like, it's weird to me that C9 won't utilize Ivern when Atrox is as strong as he currently is in top lane, Jax is another Ivern friend, right? They were playing yep. Renekton. They played it twice inside of the series, another Ivern friend, right? They're willing to play Yone, so that's another Ivern friend. But if you want to empower Berserker, why are you not playing the best jungler and also stopping the tank junglers and actually empowering your teammates? It, it, like, that fundamentally doesn't make sense to me. Um... I, I, yeah, I just don't understand. I mean, we know that Croissant in the the after to uh, you know the the press conference thing afterwards actually talked about like the drafts and stuff like that. And I I agree with like Croissant sentiment in that C nine are consistently drafting face up throughout the draft, and they're just getting kind of like vacuum answered plus like theme answered like hand in hand over and over and over. And then the games are becoming difficult, and they're actually just not getting away with bullshit. And I think like the Draven thing. Even if we like, we know that Berserker's just feeling really pressured because it's match point, and he just feels like he needs to carry. I think there's other ways to go about it with just other supporting champion picks. Um, but I don't know. C9 is just not willing to play uh, apparently other champions, and it just absolutely confuses me. What What do we think in there instead of the Draven? Like when 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 you say something that has a little bit more range can scale a little bit better. I'm thinking like a Jinx, but but. It jinx with a jinx brom what else i mean i think I, I i think pros i mean i've talked about it a lot on stream i think all pros in every region have has overreacted to the jinx nerfs or like um they'll cope out of their mind uh saying that jinx is unplayable now because she doesn't have gale force in addition to infinity edge but if you sift through all of the jinx games from spring and msi and stuff like that you'll see the gale force is on cooldown for like a lot of major fights um and that their gale force activations are like useless more often than not right um and also we can ignore the fact that jinxes would often build like kraken slayer uh a lot of the time they wouldn't even have gale force um in a lot of the games right they would just have ie and stuff so it's like completely baffling that one of berserker's best champions which is jinx they never look at it and in addition to that, they never look at Aphelios, which is his also like bread and butter champion. I think like the Kaisa ban is also really problematic. But I think that there's more problematic things that lies inside of like Blabber and, and even Eminus. Like, I think like uh, thinking that you can't play Kindred uh, without Milio or something like these really weird functional fixness ideas um, about the game relative to like champions power level, right? Jarvan is really strong. They're not playing Jarvan, um, at all. They're just forcing these tank champions over and over and over. And it's putting a lot of pressure on Eminus, who is also really underperforming and, and Fudge is also not doing great in this entire series. Yeah.
Well, I thought it was really weird that that Fudge, you know, he he spent so much of, you know, the last year incorporating carries into his gameplay. If you think about their summer finals um, last year, the Jax pick was huge for them. And Jax is in a really good state. He's played it for, you know, a long period of time now. He's playing into Dokla, who he should feel like he can at least like match skill wise. I don't see why he would, you know, feel like you can't contend Dokla in lane. And he's never picking like the 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 stronger side of the matchup. He's never like testing Dokla. Though every single time he's just responding to Dokla's pick. And it's really just Dokla testing him uh permanently. So I mean, especially like when we were talking about these drafts in games um in like game number, I believe it was three. In game number three, if you were to just give over the Maokai, right? You give over the Maokai and you run your Kaisa and you're gonna go AP Kaisa and it's gonna be really strong in NA regardless of the fact that it, you know maybe it, it it's not the best champion in the game or anything actually like why don't you just end up going something like a you know a, a Jax plus Sejuani on art on a B2 B3 and, and play towards these strengths I mean if you're a really good Jax player you can essentially play it into anything right now I mean the champion is just from my you know per, per, pers uh, perspective it's essentially just a broken champion that if you're like a really top tier player like for example 369 he's like a really insane gragas player you can match it and you can try to control it at a point but it's very hard to like beat a, a, a jackson especially if you look at how the series is going the games are going late you know it's not a clean series you're not going to get to the point where you're not going to be able to play the game you're going to get your two three items and you're going to become unkillable i'm surprised that fudge never like took any agency himself in in the series like he was just drafting Aatrox Renekton just like the ass side of the matchup and just be like oh yeah I'm just gonna exist whatever and hope that we can win a championship I felt like there was just there, was, there wasn't much like hunger out of C9 like when you look at just how they played it felt like they showed up and they wanted to like do the least they could to win the championship their mentality was was very passive and it, it was something where I just felt like they thought that if they just play solid, they'll win the series because they're a better team instead of actually like being mentally present within the series and understanding what energy is doing and trying to like actually get into that game. It felt like they were like, all right, just like stick to our guns, do what we do. We normally win when we stick to, to our guns and do what we do. So we might as well just like keep it the same. To be fair yeah. to them, isn't, isn't that what we've said? Isn't that what's worked for them the last year and a half except yeah this and, last but that, that's, like, that's like what i hate about them they're like well, that's why when i'm always talking about them it's like yeah i mean they're winning but like i don't like the way they're winning like i'm just happy that there's finally a team that put them in their place you know like you can't just show up and and, and it's such a bad mentality because when when you when you're not like practicing being present in the series and fighting over picks and coming up with like drafts that are based on what's actually happening currently in the game when you go to international tournaments and you're going to draft against some of these top Asian teams, you no longer can sit like that is not something you can do. You can't just sit back, draft something and win like you're just going to get smoked all over the map. Like they're going to have three Drakes in 18 minutes and the whole game is going to be fucking lost. You're no you're not close to good enough where you can like sit back and scale, especially in this type of meta. Like they're just they're they're not good at trading on the map they're not good at like oh okay like we give this we answer on the other side like there's definitely ways you can play the game to fend off a, an aggressive team which is pretty much all the chinese teams and even if you look at the korean teams like gen g t1 they become much more aggressive in the way that they play the, the early game they haven't spent like they never know how to how to answer and, and trade objectives and things like this so they're they're practicing a style that won't be applicable in the future anyway and then even when a team comes and they're actually challenging them they won't accept the challenge they'll just you know sit back and try to just scale their way and i don't know man it's just so frustrating to watch because i just feel like they're they're not improving at all like c9 had hasn't improved at all in like almost a year and a half in my mind uh i i also want to i, mean, I don't think they're going to improve i mean i i think that this, yeah, this is a conundrum of many many teams and i i also think that like the coaching staff that they acquired is never going to improve you look at 100 thieves when when mythy was a part of it um there's no identity traits that are noticeable if anything actually you could argue that there is an identity trait and it's a negative one uh it's it's the same rudimentary play style or approach that one would have to the game that i think is is pretty consistent probably because that's just all that he knows how to talk about i mean that's just my that assumption and i i mean it's not even really conjecture uh i guess um so it's like there's that um they brought over duffman right 
uh, in the middle mm-hmm. of the split. And we know that the whole coaching staff just completely changed last left, right? Revan went to Academy and then he left. He went to TSM. And TSM, I think, had a lot more style, like stylistic slash overall improvement when you consider that C9 has such a stacked roster. You have Max Waldo quitting uh, League of Legends and completely leaving. You have Selfie leaving the team before MSI even starts. And then who even knows what Vigar's activity is actually at right now um, with, with the current team? Um, well, I mean, I, I think some people do know, but yeah, I mean, I, I, it's not surprising to me that C9 is not going to be a team that improves. Uh, to yep. be fair, in, in every interview I did with the player, win or loss, they were always, always adamant that they were looking at the negative things that happened in the game and aware that it wasn't a clean game especially on the wins like it, it yeah i i had the same conversation with ven blabber mns the only one was like berserker berserker usually didn't kind of talk about like well if we would have played a better team we would have gotten punished uh fudge as well all four of them and mythy all all of them have said something akin to that like glad we got the win but holy shit like if we're playing someone that could punish us we would have lost here's how here's what i think we would have been like so all of them are aware of it so I, I it is you know kind of frustrating i think and that was that was the feeling that they gave off at at the press conference at the finals it was a frustrated team that knew that they didn't iterate the way that they needed to you know in, in a way that their whole season hadn't iterated the way that they needed to to be prepared for teams that could punish and then they ran into an energy team that they didn't think could punish coming into it and did. So, uh, I mean, that's a in order to grow as a team, you need to be willing to put yourself in uncomfortable situations and learn from those situations. And then once like you've experienced that, then you can improve on the new experiences that you had in this situation that you're not comfortable in. Right. When you look at NRG, the reason why they were, will, they, they won this title. The reason why they won this title is because they put themselves, they, they learn different things. They use the week to prepare to play things that they're not as comfortable on, but they went into the series with the mentality of like, I mean, we're underdogs. Like we're supposed to lose anyway. Who cares if we lose harder playing things that we're not a, a, as comfortable on? That's our only chance to win. Whereas like C9, this, this, this whole time, they're so addicted to being as comfortable as possible in everything they do because it just worked. And that's the main reason why I think that there's no improvement and, and, and everything just stays the same um, because they like, maybe this is the wake up call. Maybe they needed to lose domestically once for them to be like, all right, now we actually have to get it. But I feel like it's like so late that it's so hard for them to actually become better um, during worlds. And I know that's what like the coaching staff said. It's like, Oh, we'll like perform better at worlds. I mean, I just don't know how. I don't know how they'll perform better in worlds when like they so they they haven't improved in like I would say a year pretty much. Uh maybe they've improved on small aspects of their game, but they but like compared to everyone else, they haven't like increased the gap between themselves and other teams. What is going to change at worlds that's going to make this team actually competitive? Because I mean, at least energy is willing to like go out there and, and play to win and end up losing hard. If it, if it doesn't work, I feel like C9 is just going to go there and we're going to see the same thing that we saw against Genji. I mean, those games were probably some of the hardest to watch games. That was probably one of the worst best of fives I've ever seen. And I play um, at worlds was the C9 versus Genji. There was just nothing going on. There was no early game. There was, there were, there were no plans. It was just like, it felt completely hopeless the entire time. And even when you compare that to other times that, teams have got 3 would like last MSI, for example, EG getting 3 would by RNG. They were at least like fighting and then NRG would, or, or RNG would do something. RNG would just be able to, to make a play that they just wouldn't expect in North America where, where it's like an overload play or they like, you know, really abuse a base timer and four man dive bot. And then it was like, okay, like you can learn from that because there's, there's an experience there that you didn't have domestically, but because you're actually doing things and, and you're playing the game, like this has opened up, right? I just don't see that happening for C9. That's why that's why I'm so like negative about them in, in general. That's why I've been like, even when they won ver- versus Energy last week, why I, I have this tone with them is that I just when like you're playing in North America, right? You're you're playing at a disadvantage from the get go. How are you going to like look, actually look, 
improve. I, I will speak. Than... I will. I will speak purely from experience here. Okay, C9 okay. is more concerned with winning championships than they are with actually improving internationally. All right, that's their systems. That is just. That's just the truth. All right. So I'm speaking from experience. I can. Yeah. I can assure I can you with the utmost certainty that that their systems are designed only for domestic success and comfort. Yeah, and that's and that's the product of what happened to them in 2020. And now they've just swung back the entire way. If you remember in 2020, they were first place, they were super dominant in spring, and then they went with the mentality of, all right, like let's, you know, let's try some different things out in summer, like we're already like so good compared to everyone else, mm -hmm. and then we'll we'll just try mm -hmm. to improve the worlds. And then they collapsed, they crashed and burned, they ended up fourth, they didn't even make worlds that split, and ever since then it felt like their mentality completely changed. They said, okay, fuck all that. Like, we are just going to play for domestic success now because you do need domestic success to go to Worlds. I just think that there's, like, a balance there where they have just swung too much onto the other side of things. All right, that was the Licorice Blabber, Niski, Zven, and Vulcan roster where FlyQuest was the team that found sustained success as they got second both splits. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, what can what can you say? We can't really argue with that experience when you, you're one of the few people that have had the experience there, LS. So, and the product looks like how Dom and all of us have been uh, adjudicating it. So, I will caveat. I I don't believe in this. Um, well, since they didn't win the championship, maybe that's the motivation they'll get need to move on. But the last time. A team from North America had international success at Worlds was when Cloud9 made it out of groups and they weren't the first seed. They weren't the second seed. They were the third seed. Uh, so they didn't win the uh, LCS title that year mm. uh, back in 2015. Okay. So small, small little, okay. you know, causation might be correlation. Probably not, but we'll see. We spent a lot of time. Hopium. Yeah, that is hopium. Um, real quick, uh, esports. Uh, wanted to give a shout out to our friends over at Esports Bet. They've launched a new innovative watch to learn, watch to earn promotion just by tuning in and watching your favorite streams on Esports Bet. Users can earn up to three thousand esports coin per hour and fifty percent more for partnered streams. They can be converted to USDT rewards, and Esports Bet will be adding more exclusive prizes and bonuses down the line for more details on how this works head on over to esportsbet.io uh, to go sign up now and get yourself earning thank you to our friends over at esportsbet for making face check possible now we spent a lot of time here talking about cloud nine let's talk a little bit about energy the growth that they made and i kind of like this the the story of these players because you go down up and down the line all these players have a, a chip on their shoulder varying levels of being thrown in the in in the bin and and left uh left behind for a little bit the one that i forget about the most is ignar like ignar was straight up out of the league for yeah. a little while like on vacation and like not vacation but you know he he wasn't on a team whereas Dokla, you know, contracts, Palafox, all of them were at least grinding in academy or in a system. But like Ignar, it, it, it's so impressive to me that he, he could have he could have called it quits after Dig and and even before Dig and didn't uh, and and still found a way to have an impact and 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 move on. So uh, when you when you think about the individuals on this team, you can even go to the coaching staff with Think Card, with every single individual coach. You had Soaz, you had Juves, you had uh, Tanner Time, DeMonte in the mid lane, um, Nash at 80, carry. I don't remember who the support coach was. Sorry. Maybe it was just Croissant. But um, you have all these guys that are parts that have been left behind at some point, and that was going to be their legacy, then get the payoff of having the title. What, what jumps out at you uh, for, for these players, LS, and, and coaches? Um, I mean, I think the, the most impressive thing is that the, the team managed to have a unified identity. They were clearly willing to experiment and do things differently. They were not a team that I think, like, what was the highest placing of any content creator or analyst or anyone that was a part of the broadcast for oh, NRG? Like yeah, right, right, right. Like, everyone counted them out. And, you know, I tweeted, it's the most impressive thing about North America, I guess, in recent years. 
is that they took this roster and they managed to do what they did with it. And they did it in the way that goes against what all of like the big teams have been trying to do for so long, which is just buy victories. And I think that's what is most impressive for me about the roster. Because when I, when I watch like the individual players and stuff like that, I don't think to myself any of them stand out as top in their role or top two in their role or even top three. But it's like when the team comes together, it has an ability to best the top teams. And I think that's so impressive. But I also do think that that could be worrisome for Worlds. Definitely. I mean, there's also other aspects like, you know, for a player like Ignar, we, we've seen Ignar play for a while now, right? Everyone knows who Ignar right. is. He's the engaged support guy. Yep. That's what he does. Right. He plays like Rakan, you know, like he's the, he was the guy that was B one ing Rakan all of like 2020. Essentially, if you left it up, B one right. Rakan, that's what he would hit you with every time. And the meta hit Ignar. Like, so I think that there's players that are more versatile in this lineup and there's players that are less versatile. Ignar is one of the less versatile players and the meta hit him in a way where he could be as effective as possible. You know, he could be the best version of himself. So I think that it was, it was, it was a good time. And then the also, also just the way that the players um, adapted to, each other I think was, was really good and they play towards the strengths of the players like contracts isn't a guy who is going to you know he's not going to have the blabber games that we remember when blabber would pick Olaf and be like 15 and zero and just completely like 1v9 the entire game that's not who contracts is contracts is a player right. who wants to put early pressure on the map like he wants to get level three you know find a lane and fucking kill them and they were able to put their players in positions where they could play the best that they could. Um, and I think that that's, that's definitely a good shout out to the coaching staff, like understanding what your lineup is, where you can balance it, like how we can, you know, get contracts in a situation where he can be effective. How can we get Ignar in a situation where Ignar can be effective? Like how, how do we actually balance these imperfect players and get the best versions out of them? And every roster has imperfect players in the entire world, by the way, like even the best teams in the world have imperfect players. Dom Juan won with ghost on their lineup. You know, like, <laughs> right, 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 right. I'm, and and you just need to do this as a team. And so many teams, like, they refuse to actually embrace who they are, and they're always trying to force players to be something that they're not. And I think part of that is also players always never wanting to feel like they're a liability. So if you ask a player, "Hey, can you play this?" They'll always say yes. Yeah, of course I can play. But is that actually the best thing possible for the team? And I feel like energy, were, they were just so fucking real with each other. It's like, this is how we have to win. This is what we need to play. You know, doesn't matter if it's not optimal. This is how we're going to be the best version of themselves. How many times did we see m &S just play Jace and it just looked terrible and they end up just winning anyway at some point? But you never feel like it's a good Jace game. Like, you're never like, damn, like that's actually his strength as a player. And then when, when you spend so much time opting in to something that you're not truly good at, it's like you lose some of what you are actually good at. Then when you see MNS bounce back to champions that he should be good at, he doesn't look close to as practice on them because he probably hasn't spent as much time. You know, it's something that he's just had in his arsenal where like, oh, you know, we can use it if we, uh, you know, if we need to. So I think that energy, like it was really good roster management and it was, they were just super real with each other. And, and I appreciate that because I feel like all teams need that. They just need to, you know, really get down to the basics of like, who are you? Like, what, what, what is your best quality? How do we make, how do we connect all of these dots with all of our, all of our players? I mean, it was something that like Palafox talked about is that they argue a lot as a team. They're willing to like actually get down to like the nitty gritty of like why they were losing and why they, you know, or like what the, each, each other's flaws are and how to like cover them, how to improve. And when you actually get down to that, like base level, you strip everything else away. I feel like you can actually come to reasonable solutions that will lead you towards you know, actual victory or like the best version that the team can be. And I think that we're pretty close to like the best version this energy team can be. When you think of uh, when, when I, when, when I think about what you just said, which players had to be real with themselves and, and kind of uh, adjust their expectations. I think of both contracts and Dokla. What champions do you think of when you think of Dokla? Um, well, I think of, of Yone. I think of Yone because think of about, what he was doing Sean? before. He always hovers it. Yeah, Akshan, he always hovers it. But I, yeah. I think, I think <laughs> of, of Yone, and then I always think of Jace because he used to be a Jace one trick when he started playing like competitively in solo queue. I played with him all the time, and he was just always playing like Jace, essentially. Right. So uh, Yone, 
one that I think we all know is a pocket pick and he's had success on. It's his one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteenth most played champion. Like it's way down there. Same with uh Jace. Well, Jace is actually higher up. He's he's got it's his second most played. But he's played hmm. Renekton, Jace, Aatrox, Camille, Nar, Gangplank, uh, Gragas, Orn, Gwen, Scion. So like there you see an Orn, there you see a Scion, there you see a Gragas. You know, we we don't see the jacks that he sneakily pulled out, but he ha- and and Juan uh, both clearly identified like, hey, you're the you're the weak side. You're gonna get the least amount of resources. We're gonna play through mid. We're gonna play through bot. And here's Dokla having all these carry champions and having the nickname Big Dokes from his carry opportunities in the past. And then having that realization of being real and being like, all right, well, if I'm weak side, I can't play all of these guys like the way that I want to. I'm not going to get the attention. If I fall behind on one of these carries, I'm basically out of the game. What are other ways that I can have impact on it? And I think he's another player that really um, accepted the role and being real with himself while giving a more carry spotlight on FBI, which I think is a given that he got added on in. And that's why they added him as well as Palafox, who got to show off very much so he can hang with the best that North America has had uh, and, and is and has been class. And we just didn't give him the tip of the cap. Um, Ellis, what, what did you make of kind of the, the stories of some of these, uh, I guess uh, the, the uh, identities that they had to leave behind and ones that might've surprised you. I mean, I think, I, I, I mean, in general, right? I mean, it's it's just like what I said a little bit earlier on inside the show. It, it's very impressive that a lot of the, the players who were all counted out managed to ride through the storms, right? They've been around forever. I think there was like, there was an interesting tweet. I can't remember who it was that tweeted. It might have been Emily, where she ended up talking about uh, when some of the players first came onto the scene, the community was calling for their heads and saying that they should just be replaced. Um, and yet they're still around. I think like, um, especially like on, uh, you know, NRG Palafox, um, in general, he was someone that last year, I think he, he came to Korea. He was like part of the boot camping, uh, players that I think I ended up helping out. And so he was someone that to my knowledge was always doing like the independent boot camps on his own accord. Like it was just something that he wanted to always pursue. He wanted to, to follow and stuff. I think contracts like not giving in, not quitting or anything like that. I think that that is very admirable inside of the space. And then Dokla Definitely. is someone that I don't know how to, how to feel about Dokla's like evolution sort of stuff over the years. It, it's like weird in that it, it almost, I don't, I don't know. I actually don't know how to phrase it. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know how, I don't, I don't have words for it. I mean, I yeah. think Dokla just had like a major breakthrough in 2022 spring in Academy. And I, I would I would love to actually, you know, this, these are the stories. This is the content that needs to be done by these organizations. What was the Dokla breakthrough? Because when he came back to LCS in, in 2023 or 2022 summer, he looked like a completely different player. He was so much better at, at so many things that he, he was deficient at previously. Um, and something happened in that split with, I believe it, yeah, it was CLG Academy at the time where he was able to improve so much and no one just knows like really, um, you know, w- what it is. But I mean, I always felt like Dokla had huge holes in his game and then combined with like the holes in his game, he just was never able to lane against top tier players and he got better at right. it. And suddenly when he came back, he was playing all these carries like he was for the first half of that split. He was just dominating everyone with like Yone and, and, and different um Carry picks. I mean, the whole identity of that CLG team was uh, the double flex between Palafox and and Dokla. Like they could all share a bunch of champions, um, which just made right. drafting against them pretty annoying. So, like Dokla, he's he, he was somebody who I think like most people wrote him off. Like I mean, I don't I don't watch Academy, so I don't really know what the the specific issues were. But he went from somebody who played in OCE, then he got onto Optic pretty early on. He was limited. He wasn't like bad, but he wasn't like maybe he was like the seventh best top laner or like eighth best top laner during most of his time right. um, in LCS. Banished to TSM Academy for like a year. Then he spends another like year and a half in Academy on top. Like normally once you've went from being in LCS to two and a half years in Academy, you're just done. And I, like he was able to just somehow make something of that experience and, and you know, improve himself. And Contrax pretty much did the same thing. I mean, 
people were pretty done with him in, in LCS after 2019. Like he had that brief stint on 100 Thieves. He had that brief stint on EG at the end of both summers, but it never felt like he was going to be considered for like a, you know, serious spot. I mean, yeah, he was the Band-Aid fix. Yeah, it was the Band-Aid fix. Right. He was kind of considered like a um, he was considered like the the player that once you got used to how he plays, he wouldn't be very effective, but he could give you like two or three like pretty explosive games and like catch people off guard. That was kind of his mm -hmm. niche, right? And just for him to become so solid, uh, uh, you know, in, in this playoff run, I think speaks volumes to his ability to actually understand what the reasons were why he was so inconsistent because he was an inconsistent player for years and years. And then uh, finally, just want to give uh, these couple players their due. We talked to Ignar, we talked contracts, we talked um, uh, Dokla. Uh, let's put a lens on FBI here who was, was, was left out twice. Twice. This is his third team in three splits. Like, I think people forget that, right? He was part of that long-standing 100 Thieves roster, him and Hui being buds. And they're still really good buds, but they love to talk shit about each other. Then going to EG, and it's like, all right, cool. This is the this is the EG super team. Uh, they reload there on the bottom side of the map with FBI because, uh, you know, they that solves their issue with Danny not being there and uh, Kyori not being the guy. This is going to be it. They move on from him. By the way, hilarious story from what I heard uh, when they were and I will double check this, but whatever, you know, me telling stories and then it getting clipped and then me getting in trouble. That's the thing. Um, what I heard was they were going to do the fire sale, right? They're like, OK, we've got to sell our players and our costs are too high. And then, you know, instead of letting Andy and uh, uh, the management team <laughs> over at Evil Geniuses like sell high and teams don't know. <laughs> I heard uh, LaPointe went into the owners meeting saying, hey, we're blowing up our roster before they sold anything. And so it just tanked all the value of all the players. <laughs> nice. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. She was really good at her job. <laughs> That's just so crazy. That's literally just oh, she yeah. did the nobody wants Dardock. She did the Lena. Yeah, she, she just did, did it not on a stream. She did it like on purpose at an owners meeting. Damn, that's next level. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty funny. So which means energy was able to get them probably affordably, affordably. Hopefully you got paid. I'm sure you got paid, but you know, the transfer fee probably wasn't as high and then able to move on from Luger with Luger and Poom. So uh FBI coming on in and slotting in and being the player that has had the experience of uh being at finals, being the guy that makes the winning play, as you said, Dom putting himself in uncomfortable positions and failing and learning from it. it, it kind of weird to think FBI as like the, the, the veteran, but cause I don't think he would be a veteran compared to all these guys on the roster, but the guy that's had the experience Dom, to, to, to take him to the promised land. Yeah. I mean, FBI was a, just a huge improvement. I mean, you could tell based off like the, um, the CLG run in playoffs in spring that the the bottling was just the issue right like Poom, Poom I, I think Poom is just not very good like his time on Dignitas I thought he was bad this year I thought his time on CLG was not good and then Luger had a horrible playoff series like I don't know if you remember the the playoff series versus uh I believe oh, it was yeah. EG where he was just running it like he was just running it in some of the worst ways possible um ran himself out of a job unlike yeah so I mean, this this was a huge. It was it was so nice for the CLG team, this energy team, I guess now to actually have a stable bot laner. Like they just needed that so badly. They needed the guy where they can just play the game normally, where you don't feel this sense of impending doom when you're playing the game. Like, oh, is this guy gonna run it down at some point? Or like, there, are the resources actually in good hands? I mean, FBI, he's pretty consistent, and you know, I think that that was the the value he brought to this team is you have a lot of players that have high highs and low lows, like Contracts is one, Doklo is one, Palafox is like probably a little bit higher floor, maybe yeah, probably, probably like same ceiling. Maybe Palafox is a little bit better at not having like the real terrible games, um, but they just desperately needed st some stability and FBI was actually able to, to bring it. And it also seems like there needs to be a player on a team that just like, understands like what his job is and like how, how to take recallers the way Bwipo, um said it said it to me is you need a dedicated recaller on the team you need the guy that when they have an advantage they know like okay like we don't need to flip anything here like 
our jungler wants to go for Herald or something, I'm just going to take the recall and like just not push my lead as much as humanly possible because that's not what's necessary. What's necessary is that I actually, you know, maintain my advantage so that we're able to win the game. Um, and I feel like FBI fall of, like falls into that role where he can just, you know, just always end up being relevant by never falling super far behind and never throwing his leads. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and think about it. He, he got solo killed a couple times, I think, in both series um, early on, but was still able to um, solidify his lane. Uh, LS, sorry, Dominic Control. No, no, no. I was agreeing with them. Okay, great. Well, again, shout outs to all of the energy team, roster squad, and just, you know, a, a light, a heartfelt shout out to the CLG uh, management and, and, and people behind the scenes as well who had pushed for this and basically had a lot of this roster left in, in place. I, I asked Andy Miller, the CEO, like, hey, you guys, you came in and had the opportunity to, to change up the roster, to change up the staff, and you kept everyone in place. Plus, again, all the coaches that were in the back end. And, and it brought you success. What did you think of that? And he was like, well, I came in and uh, we did an assessment and asked the coaching staff and, and management, Jonathan um, uh, uh, Kamikaze, uh, uh, what, what he thought was best. And they said, let's let's run with it. We've got some good going here and paid off. So shout outs to uh, everyone involved. Congratulations on the win. Uh, last thing, let's, let's touch on TL a little bit here. Um, the, the forgotten team that was also a part of this thing and brought energy to five games. Uh, what did you make of TL and how do you feel about TL as we're there moving towards worlds here, Dom? TL? Ooh, I don't know. I think TL is just, uh, they're very hard to, to, to get behind. I feel like so much of it always comes down to, to Summit's champion pool and the thing about the series that, that was really concerning to me is like, it feels like there's an, a need to find the perfect champion for Summit that doesn't even end up being good for the game. Like the, the, the NAR game was terrible, right? Yeah. But there's opportunities for him to pick the Jacks that was like running the entire first series or like whenever he got it. I mean, it was he was just smurfing, right? And then we don't even take those opportunities when we have them later on. So I feel like TL is just they're they're just not a complete team. Like when you look at energy, there's a level of cohesiveness that TL just doesn't have, you know, like they have two players that are considered way better than everyone else in Pioshik and Summit, and they just try to draft for champions that they want, and hopefully everyone else can fall into place. Don't think it's a recipe for success. What do you think, Ellis? Um, I feel like, I don't know, I, I feel like the last couple of weeks, uh, APA became more restricted, perhaps, than like what he was willing to play. I mean, I think it's obviously good that you know he drops uh playing the jace and the tristana because those are just two champions that i, I don't think that uh he should have been playing i agree with dom and that it seems like they look for angles for summit to give him a counter pick but then he chooses his own counter pick and the counter pick isn't good for the game it's good for himself it's not and it's this like, is like a problem huh yeah i was gonna say a lot of times it's not even that good for himself like he just like counter picks himself with counter pick r5 like it's so weird yeah yeah it, it's it's really strange i mean the nar pick in in the final game was absolutely atrocious i mean I, th I think that that's really bad yeah um i think like the game four. i mean i think game in four even them winning that is actually like horrible or it's like it, it's kind of like funny in a way that they actually managed to win that game because they just chose an entire team comp that was actually bad into aurelian soul and poppy and they managed to just get so far ahead it doesn't matter but like i think that game is still indicative of problems that team liquid has as a team um you know I, I like i mean i just feel bad for steve that's all i tweeted man that's all it's all i tweeted like this this roster it was it was you know it it failed all right it failed. i mean wait I, they're going to worlds and you look at you look at a, a failure compared to you know like even like golden guardians who had low expectations and then high expectations and then fell short right. or fly quest or it, it failed it yeah. failed 100 percent because the thing is like <laughs> This is the this is the problem. You can it's not a third place finish where the league was looking insanely competitive and the teams that should have been better than you were just better than you. Like if FlyQuest is above them and C9's above them and they get third and FlyQuest looks like good, they look on another level, C9's really got their shit together, the most dominant team, then you you look at the third place differently. 
when you contextualize how the league was, this was an open fucking split. This was a split where anyone could win. You know, like even C9, who was dominant most of the time, they didn't even look that good. I mean, we saw Energy winning it. Energy is not winning a split where things are like super locked into like top teams and, you know, mid table teams. I mean, they were able to get to a point because, you know, teams were flawed this split. Um, so when you contextualize everything, like the third place finish doesn't feel like a massive win for, for TL as an organization. I think it's a win for like APA, for example. Sure. Uh, like, I think that there's certain players that could be happy with it. But I yeah. mean, when you, when you go for a all Korean speaking roster with two world champions and one of like the most dominant laning top laners we've ever seen in North America and the, the, the games look like this. It doesn't look like that. Like they, they were playing super well. Like it didn't feel like there was any synergy around objectives, which was the whole idea around the roster. Like the core JJ shot calling factor seems almost non-existent. He's just like dying before every single fight. Uh, most of the time, I, I would say everything considered like TL should have, they should have at least got top two this split to consider it a success in my mind with what happened to everyone else. LS. Yeah. I mean, I, I think Dom hits the nail on the head and why I, I also call it a failure. It, it's that this split really shows that if you just have the entity and you have a coach, that it's almost really difficult to make it into playoffs, so into like upper standings. Um, like, I, you know, I mean, it's, it's not as big of a, a failure as like the FlyQuest squad, but, you know, I mean, that, uh, that, was, a, that was a different type of failure. But, I think, like, what, what do we expect for, for Team Liquid at Worlds? What, like, like what, what is the actual expectation? I think this is one of the main problems. We're talking about the end of North America, but the end of North America had it so that apparently Team Liquid, I mean, in theory, they're kind of second because clearly they pushed NRG to five games and they actually looked like they could win, whereas C9 looked like they couldn't, right? Um, so, I mean, there's that. But if you look at the top three teams, can we confidently say that our first, second, or third seed is actually any noticeably different than one another going up against the international teams? And I think the answer is no. It's a tough year, man. It's a really tough year. It's There's a bad like, year. It's a tough year. It's a tough year. There's three good teams coming out of China. Like, Weibo is sketchy, but like... If Weibo had plays the best of five versus any of these teams, I'm choosing Weibo. Weibo, like I think Zhao is going to fuck it. He is going to turn up, bro. If Zhao has to play against MNS, Palafox, and APA, it's going to be rough. That's all I'm saying. So, like, this is the issue: is when you start looking internationally, it's like, damn, that's that's the worst team going from that other region. I'm expecting I'm expecting another, you know, disappointing run. Maybe not three and fifteen. I mean, obviously there's there's not as many games this time because it's a Swiss stage, but I could see, you know, three NA teams bottom four. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Well, uh hopefully Golden Guardians beats Fnatic or BDS, yep. whichever one qualifies on through. I think Golden Guardians has is is the most built for international, yeah. Uh, that's that's how I felt. Yeah. I mean, they they look sketchy, but I mean, I wonder I wonder what form Gory will show up in. Maybe he'll get Korea buff, you know? Yeah, I, I think he's I think he went home early uh, to 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 fight off some um, homesickness. What I hear, it, River is fine in North America. He he's adjusted, whereas Gory was was homesick by the end. So uh, he'll get that time. They'll get to the boot camp. And uh, get kicked off there. Um, you guys answered my last question, which was, how do you think we're going to do at Worlds? But, you know, we got the Doomers over here. Maybe I'm the only one that thinks uh, we, we've, got, we've got some caliber, some class that can get us into quarterfinals, get us out of, <laughs> or like, get us into the top eight. Top eight, right? It's a different format. So, it, oh, just, man. Uh, like, yeah, it's tough. I mean, the Korean <laughs> and Chinese teams, are, I mean, look, I don't think the second, like, I think T1 will, will show up and be fine at Worlds. I think Gen G will obviously be solid enough. I'm not sure how good, like, whether it's Hanwha Life, Dom Wan, KT. I mean, KT will probably be okay. Maybe there'll be one shaky Korean team, one shaky LPL team, and then there's G2. That 
I mean, you'd expect that they would get their shit together and perform. I think it's hard because I think there's like nine teams that should almost certainly be better than the best NA team. At least nine. Yeah, at least nine. Yeah. It feels bad. Four plus G2. Um, Okay. All right. Well, with that, uh, we're almost done and dusted. Our final segment of the day is the one that we always do here on Face Check. Thanks to our friends over at Esports Bet. Time for Face Check all in. And I know that normally, normally we do this on LCS and you're saying, Dion, LCS is over. Well, the season is never over until the world championship is hoisted. So our friends over at Esports Bet is giving us a neat promotion for our viewers. If it is your first time playing and depositing on the site, you can get 50% bonus on your first deposit up to 100 USDT. So make sure to go sign up over at Esports Bet and details on the site. And feel free to contact, uh, uh, use the contact button to uh, answer any information that you need uh all right let's knock this one out here guys um let's 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 go on these uh lec matches we got two lec matches here uh uh actually three lec matches but two that uh for this weekend we've got bds versus sk and we've got fanatic versus excel dom on our other show I believe you said excel was going to take care of business and knock down mad lions wasn't the case nope so now excel are a uh, 3.4 over Fnatic, which is... They looked uh, bad. They looked very bad. It, it really buffed the numbers, but it looked very bad. Um, and then BDS and SK are basically a toss-up at 1.8 for BDS and 1.99 for SK. Uh, where are you going to go uh, for our uh, face check all-in bet? I mean, 3.4 seems crazy low. <laughs> for, like, considering they just beat... Like, they just beat Fnatic before. I mean, I guess what I would do is I would go uh, the handicap. So, XL plus 1.5 at 2.043 odds. I think that that's uh, my best bet. Because I feel like the cha- like them just winning two games in the series at over two odds, I think that that's, like, really good value there. So, that would be my bet. All right, Give, giving us some back uh, to the Fanatic pants. Where uh, LS, are you here? Where, where, when you're? Yeah, I'm. I'm, about- I'm here. L- listen, LEC is not the play. Okay, you can bet your house, your second <laughs> grandparents. Come on, okay. Doesn't matter how shit the odds are. It's impossible to lose. Which okay. one? You dis- you 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 disconnected us. Which where are we going with our bet? <laughs> Damwon Damwon versus DRX. All right, we're going to okay. Korea. Damwon versus DRX. Bet the house you can't lose. It is it's impossible. Uh, well, DRX is it's eight. It's eight point oh to D plus at one point oh. <laughs> yeah, but 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 you can bet the house. Okay, so it's it, nice. it's fine. All right, you can bet the house. You could win like a carpet, and you could potentially lose the house. Lose nice. the house. Yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> but it's a it's a free carpet. Okay, free carpet. All right. Well, uh, DRX. Like, you know, DRX. The organization again, uh, trying to stay afloat. The only returning member there is Barrel. So it's the barrel versus deft matchup here. Who will continue to meet Pyoshik of all people who qualified for Worlds? At Worlds, we'll, we'll find out. Um, all right. Get your free carpet there with the 1.08 odds for uh, D+. I will get my free carpet, yes, sir. Uh, for me, uh, G2 and Mad Lions, this is the one where uh, Mad Lions doesn't show up. They always get the playoff buff, but their playoff buff got them to uh like a step away from the world stage right the they they at least play in the uh world's qualifier now if they lose here so uh i'll take i'll I'll take g2 just give me the nice g2 money that's almost like carpet money a little bit more than carpet money at 1.26 um yeah there we go so those are our face check all in bets uh if you want free currency that you can exchange to usdt for a limited time sign up through the ESB link today, and you can claim free ESC by doing any of the three things. Join the ESB Discord for 
10,000 esports coin. Uh, follow esports bet on Twitter at esports bet for 5,000 esports coin and follow esports bet.io on Instagram for five more thousand esports coin. And after doing any of these things, contact the ES esports bet customer service in their discord uh to be given the currency for free all right everyone that's it another season of lcs in the books i feel like I, i'm saying that a lot guys but it, yeah we had a regular season in the books now we had a whole season in the books a new champion raises their banner in the raptors over at the riot arena not lcs arena anymore riot arena and it's been a pleasure guys uh as always final closing words for our was it is it our fourth year or fifth year together dom i don't remember uh five years yeah we started in what 2019 so half a decade bro <laughs> half a decade of face check Based. uh final words here ls Based. there we go <laughs> nice and easy thank you everyone for watching and supporting it's been great building this community uh with all of you and then getting to see you guys and hearing your stories over at events it's been great make sure to subscribe to this channel help us out uh with our friends over at esports bet on behalf of myself these two goobers uh let's see who else joe uh melina uh who who who's our editor for us now tom i don't want to say the wrong name uh, i don't i don't know the person that does it oh, i've never okay. met him whoa, right. whoa 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 what well no nothing you can't say that. he's gonna they're gonna feel hurt no apologize <laughs> just cut it out joe just cut out <laughs> this whole section Thank you so much, guys, for watching. We'll catch you guys uh, for, I guess, a little bit of world, but definitely next split. See ya.